evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our Keeping It Real lecture series, where our topic this um, today is Black women. Let me make sure I say it correctly. Black women's vital role in the civil rights movement. And we are fortunate and blessed to have Baba Zach A. Kondo, BCCC history professor, author, scholar, uh, lecturer, and activist. And this is a co-sponsored program by the History Club, the Anthropology and Sociology Club, Department of Education, Social Behavior Sciences, and the Office of Student Life and Engagement. So we are excited to have Baba Zach Kondo again. Uh, I'm sure this is gonna be an interesting and we are gonna leave more educated than we came in. So Baba Zach, take it away. Okay, thank you, Bono. Um, I'm looking and see whether or not we got any anybody who could give me um, permission to speak. And it looked like I'm probably older than everybody. No, you're not uh, older than me. Huh? I'm the oldest, I think. Okay, okay, well, uh, uh, will you give me uh, permission? Uh, I may I have permission to speak, please? Yes, you may. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here. We're following up from, uh, uh, from the presentation that we gave uh, February the 26th. Um, and as promised, we said that uh, we had mentioned a topic that we wanted to cover. We didn't have time, of course, to cover it in that presentation. So we said we would cover it for uh, Women's History Month. So this is why we are here. Now, the topic that we will spend the next few, or uh, well, the next hour or so, give or take. Um, I wanna talk about the vital role that African women played in the civil rights movement. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with me or don't, don't know me or anything about me, I use the word African when I talk about black women or black men or black children, I will use the word African the way most people would use the word African-American. So I don't wanna confuse you. So just know when you hear me say African, right now it's gonna be, I'm talking about Africans in the United States. If I uh, have to talk about Africans from other regions like the Caribbean or the continent or Canada or somewhere, I will let you know. So right now, if you hear the word African, um, don't think you know continental, don't think Caribbean, just, you know, think Africans, period. Uh, I'm a Pan-Africanist, and I do not make regional type distinctions when I talk about my people, okay? Now, what I'm hoping to do today is kind of like two, two things. I'm gonna talk about people that you, should, that you probably have heard of, but I'm also gonna talk about people that you haven't. So the purpose here is to give you a good overview of the important role that African women in the United States have played or played in the civil rights movement. And so I'm gonna start roughly in the, roughly in the 1940s, and then I'm gonna take it up into the 1970s. And ultimately we will cover a little bit into the 21st century as well. So let me go ahead and begin. The first person that I wanted to talk about is a name that the average person has not heard of. But if you study her and get the 411 on her, she's somebody that you would want to know about. Her name is Paul Lee Mary. Now, her birth name was Pauline. But as she got older, uh, she preferred to go by Paul Lee. And so, of course, that's what we will refer to her as. Um, Paul, Re uh, Paul Lee Mary was born in, of all places, Baltimore. She was born in uh, 1910. And she will be on this planet until, until July, until July the 24th, 1985. I can be precise. So she's gonna be here for a little while, 
But during that time that she's here, um, she will do some extraordinary things. Now, she was born in Baltimore, but then they're gonna move to Durham, North Carolina. And so she's gonna grow up in Durham. Uh, eventually she's going to go to college. Uh, she's gonna go to Hunter College in uh, New York City. Uh, from there, she's gonna go to Howard Law School. She will graduate top of her class. From there, she's going to go to the University of California, Berkeley and get a master's in law. And then from there, she's gonna go to Yale and she's gonna get a PhD in what they call judicial studies, which I have no idea what the hell that means, but I guess is the equivalent of a law degree, a PhD degree in law. Um, Pauli Mary is going to be busy during her lifetime. Now, civil rights will be a major focus of her adult life. We will first see her when she was at Howard, for example, she participated in several, the students at Howard were in the vanguard of desegregating or of trying to desegregate uh, public, uh, public establishments, restaurants, uh, theaters, um, you know, uh, those types of things. And she and several other students were in the forefront of doing that. When she was 30 years old, she uh, took a trip south. And then when she was coming back in Virginia, uh, they sat, her and her companions sat in the white section because, you know, Virginia was segregated during this time period. So this was 1940. And so she was arrested. Her and her companion were arrested and they were charged. And this was uh, in many ways, you know, she was ultimately uh, released, had to go to court. They changed it from violating segregation laws to, um, to a you know, misdemeanor, disrespecting the cop type of thing. So that didn't go anywhere. But I tell you this only to make this point. In many ways, even though they were doing the picketing when they were at Howard, this was kind of like her first entry into civil disobedience on that level. Now, when she was at Howard, she was the only African woman at the Howard Law School. And the sexism at Howard was bad. Um, sometimes she was even ridiculed by the brothers. Um, her experience at Howard um, induced her to create a new concept. Thanks, baby. To create a new concept, which she called Jane Crow. And what Jane Crow basically meant was she was basically marrying the racism that African women had to regularly confront in the United States with the sexism that African women regularly confronted. And hence, this concept of Jane Crow, you know, served as a reminder that African women, you know, had to deal with issues that the average person, even marginalized person, did not have to deal with. And of course, in 1989, just to kind of go full circle with this, a sister by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw is going to take Jane Crow and she's going to broaden it to what she called intersexuality. And what that basically means is that African women not only had to deal with racism, but she also had to deal with sexism, just like Pauli Murray said. And then what Crenshaw added to the equation was also classisms and some other isms around the corner. So in other words, you know, what, what Pauli Mary experienced is not gonna go away uh, no time soon. Okay, so let me get back to her. So she studies law 
And what she did in 1950, she published a very important legal book. The name of the book was State's Laws on Race and Color. Small, you know, pamphlet sized book. But in this book, what Pauline Murray did was she laid the foundation for how to destroy Jim Crow. And I'm assuming everybody knows what Jim Crow is, but Jim Crow means legalized segregation. This was the law of the land in the United States uh, since even before slavery in some places. So this particular book, she outlined different strategies and the heart of her philosophy was that the way that you destroy Jim Crow in the United States you must go after Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was a Supreme Court decision that was handed down in 1896. And what it basically did, and, 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 and I'm, I'm thinking that most of you probably already, you might remember Plessy in your study. But what Plessy basically did was it, it validated the separate but equal doctrine. And all that basically meant was the law said that separation between the races is a good thing or segregation between the races is a good thing. But theoretically, it doesn't violate the constitution so long as the separation is equal, which by the way, never happened in the United States. If it was separate, then that meant it was unequal. And what I mean by that is say, for example, you're, you know, you're in, you know, you're on a, a bus which we're gonna be talking about anyway. You're on a bus and there's a cutoff point between the African section and the white section. Well, normally on those buses, they would make sure that the white section is clean. They would clean it every time. But the African section, if you leave something there, they're not gonna clean it. So separate but equal sounded good on paper, but in reality, it was never the case. Same thing with bathrooms. They'll clean the white bathrooms, but not the African bathrooms. If, if it's a, uh, a, a waiting room, a sitting room, anything like that, they keep those things sanitized. If it's white and it's African, they don't care. It, it might be next week when they get to it. So my point is, is that separate but equal has never been a doctrine that was fairly practiced in the United States. So let me get back to Pauli Murray. So what Pauli Murray basically said, was the way to destroy Jim Crow in this country. You got to go after Plessy versus Ferguson. You have to overturn it. So that was the strategy that she recommended. And ultimately this will be the strategy that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who is gonna be, you know, that's the institution that's gonna be most responsible for destroying Jim Crow in the United States was the NAACP legal defense fund. And that's gonna be the strategy that they're going to use. Now, one other side note that I wanna talk about real quickly. In her book, she also talked about gender issues and she gave a strategy for how to attack sexism legal sexism in the United States as well. And what she argued in her book was to go after the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. Now, this is what's interesting about this. In 1971, a very important gender justice case will go to the Supreme Court. It's called Reed versus Reed. And the ACLU, the uh, Civil Liberties Union, will be the, the plaintiff in the case. They're the ones that's going to argue the case. And it was about you know sexism between a husband and a wife type of thing. And this was interesting. Future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Some of you remember her because she. She was in the news uh, several months ago. She passed. I think it was September the 18th, 19, uh, 2020, she passed. So she, she got a lot of play. I think they also did a, they also did a play. Y'all get that? They also did a play on her. 
Did anybody catch that? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. So yes. anyway, she okay. Yeah. I'll repeat it. So <laughs> she got play in the press because you know because she passed. But but before she passed, they also did a play on her that made Broadway and all that type of stuff. But, okay. Anyway, and she did a movie play. on Netflix. Okay. Okay. Right. I think. Uh, but I think even before that, I think it was actually something on Broadway. And then I think that from there they get the movie. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Here's the thing. Ginsburg was prominent for her advocacy for women's rights. And that was primarily white women's rights. But here's the thing. In Reed versus Reed, Ginsburg, because she took from Pauli, Mary, for the most part, and then there was one other. There was a um, a uh, white woman uh, named uh, Kenya, who she also took for took from. So she put their names on the brief along with her own name, because she wanted to acknowledge the fact that she was taking their ideals and using them as her strategy in her case. So they win the case and they begin to break down some of the gender barriers in the United States. So she's giving her big props. Here's the problem though. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, was an, an associate justice to the Supreme Court for 27 years. And in 27 years, you know, every, you know, every term, Supreme Court justices get law clerks to clerk for them. These are basically law students. Um, you know, and, and their job is to do research for them and write briefs and all that type of stuff. In 27 years on the court, guess how many African clerks Ginsburg had? One. She had an African woman. That's it. So on the one hand, she's thanking the brilliant mind of Pauli Mary for crafting this case for her, but she didn't think enough of Africans, students to use them as law clerks. So anyway, I don't want to get, I don't want to digress, but I needed to make, I needed to make that point. Now, let me get back to Pauli Mary so we can kind of wrap her up. So her legal genius is going to ultimately be used in the Brown case, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And that will basically dismantle legally Jim Crow in the United States. And her argument for the equal protection law will help clause, will help to dismantle sexist laws in the United States. So you've got this African woman on two fronts. She is basically on two fronts cleaning house, you know, and breaking down barriers, legal barriers in the United States. Now, eventually she, um, she spends a year in Ghana and she teaches at the, uh, at the law school at the uh, University of Ghana. Uh, she also teaches at uh, Benedict College, and she teaches at Brandeis University. So that's pretty much how she's going to, you know, utilize her her uh, legal. Even though at Brandeis she was actually a distinguished professor of American Studies versus, you know, a law professor and stuff. Now, a few other things. She was also a co-founder of Now. NOW stands for the National Organization for Women. And this is the preeminent white middle-class women's, um, you know, uh, women's, women's rights organization. So she, along with Shirley Chisholm, will be a co-founder of that. And, and you know, that was founded in 1966. Um, and then in 1977, she decides to go another route. Um, she resigns from uh, Brandeis, Brandeis, and she decides to go to a seminary. 
to study, you know, religion and what have you. And so she basically studied to be a, uh, a priest, a Episcopalian priest, uh, a priest. And so she's going to do that for the next um, eight, uh, eight years or so, you know, and, and when she dies, that's what she's doing. Um, and eventually she dies in 1985 of a, a brain hemorrhage. Um, but what we want to talk about is the fact that here you have a woman who influenced a generation of race warriors, of feminists. And then the other thing that we need to bring in this, even though she didn't put a lot of emphasis on it, is the uh, LGBTQ community. Um, if you read her autobiography, she, she was constantly, you know, dealing with her sexuality. Um, she married at one stage and then, you know, she said it was, you know, she divorced and then she, um, she had lesbian relationships. And then toward the end of her life, that's when she changed. That's when she dropped Pauline and started going by Pauline. Today, we would, we would generally consider her to be a trans person. She started wearing, you know, men's clothes, um, but she never technically came out the closet. So the LGBTQ community, they kind of claim her, you know, as I think that they should. And if you read her autobiography, she talks to about, she's okay about being a lesbian, but she doesn't never talk about the whole trans thing, you know, so, you know. So here, this is, this is the final thing that I want to say about her. Here you have a woman, if there had been another universe, she should have been the chief justice of the Supreme Court in another, you know, in another world, in another life with her legal mind. But she lives in the United States, a country that was racist for her lifetime, a country that was extraordinarily racist, extraordinarily sexist, and also hated on people who had alternative lifestyles. So that's the universe that she was born into. And yet, despite all these types of barriers, the legacy that this sister left is still extraordinary. I mean, think about the change that she fomented just with her legal ideals and how many people that is going to help in the next 30, 40 years of her life. So Pauli Mary, um, by the way, she has been designated uh, as a permanent part of the calendar of saints for the Episcopal Church. So they also, you know, after she died in 1985, they came to recognize, you know, the, you know, just how extraordinary and exceptional a Pauli Mary was okay so from here i want to i want to stay on on the legal thing just very very briefly for african women okay so we talked about one of the great legal minds with regard to this country and with regard to african women now african women as far as the civil rights movement is concerned and we're leading up to the civil rights movement also played important roles in important Supreme Court cases that deal with civil rights. And there's two that I just want to mention real, real quickly. They were plaintiffs in two of the most important, like if you did a survey of important civil rights cases leading up to the Brown case, both of these cases will be front and center on that list. And the first case was Morgan versus the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, this was a 1946 case. And what it basically stands for is that the Supreme Court held that it was unconstitutional to practice segregation when you're dealing with interstate commerce. In this particular case, what they're really talking about is people riding buses and those types. In, in other words, interstate means dealing from one state to another state. And what they were basically saying is you can't have laws that say in this state, 
blacks and whites can sit together, but in the next state, they can't. So we got to change the laws and stuff. The sister who was involved in that, her name was uh, Irene, Irene Morgan was her name. And, you know, the important thing to remember is that she basically violated this law purposely, expected to get arrested, charged, go to jail, bailed out, and then was willing to follow through on this case. So Irene Morgan, one of the reasons why you can get on a train, you can get on a plane, you can get on a, a bus, or even a subway system is because the sisters like Irene Morgan, even if we don't know their names. And this is long before Brown and the cases that we're coming up to. And then the other person, her name was Ada Scipio. Now, Ada Scipio was in Oklahoma. And basically what it was here was this. She was an African woman who wanted to go to graduate school at Oklahoma State University. And so she applied to Oklahoma State and they said, no, because they had segregation laws, we will not accept you. So she took the case to the Supreme Court and what they basically held, and, 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 and this, is, this is an interesting case. What they basically held in this case is that a state, in this case, it was a graduate school, but it ultimately is gonna go broader than graduate school is going to include professional schools as well. But what it's basically saying is this, if you have a state that has a law that bars Africans from attending, then it's the state's responsibility, if there is not an African school that she can go to that's comparable, then the state must admit that person. So the importance of this case is it's going to start breaking down the legal barriers that African people who, you know, who go to graduate school, who go to professional schools had to confront. So this is just another important step in civil rights law. So you got Irene and you got Ada, two very important civil rights cases. Now I've alluded to Brown a couple of times. So now let's bring in Brown. Brown versus the Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. Most of you should know that particular case. You should have had that case in probably elementary school. You should have heard of it. Middle school, you should have heard of it. High school, you should have heard of it. And it stands for the principle um, that separate but equal cannot exist. And it also overturned the Plessy case that I talked about. Plessy, remember that was the 1896 case that upheld the doctrine of separate but equal. So let's talk about Brown. Now, the first thing that I always like to do in my classes when we talk about Brown is we need to go back to Virginia in 1951. There's a high school, I think she was a sophomore. There's a high school sophomore her name is Barbara Johns. She lives in the Farmville, Virginia area. And I think that's South, that's Southwest Virginia. And she attends Robert Moton High School. Robert Moton High School is an African public school. It's the only high school in, in the region. And the conditions of the high school is despicable. When it rains or snows, it comes into the building, into the classrooms. When it's cold outside, the students there, if you're close to a heater, you were okay. If you were not, and in her case, she oftentimes was not close to a heater, then you froze. There was not resources available for them to keep the lawns up on the campus. The books that they used were outdated. You get the drift. But what would happen is this, when she and some of her classmates would walk home, they would pass the white high school in the region. And it was state 
of the art. The architecture was new wave. They had a courtyard during the warmer months. They would pass white students outside with their teachers sitting on the lawn, this groomed lawn with all types of different uh, places for people to, to be able to relax. And they're using new textbooks. So anyway, Barbara Johns has enough. So what she decided to do was to organize a protest. She's 16 years old. But it wasn't just, a, just any protest. They put some thought in it. And I'm, I'm gonna run it down pretty quickly in the interest of time. The date is April the 23rd, 1951. And this is what they did. At a particular time, the principal at the school got a phone call. And the phone call basically said that, that two of your students are, are about to be arrested. You need to come down to the, to the mall or wherever it was. And you need to come like right away. So the principal being a responsible principal, he hauled ass. He dropped what he was doing. He left the building. Then what she did was she forged a letter, a memo from the principal that was given to the teachers in all the classrooms, basically saying that at a certain time, like in the next hour or something like that, there will be an assembly, a mandatory assembly that the entire school must attend. So they get the people in the auditorium. And this little 16 year old girl walks on stage and it's like 450 students. She walks on stage, she goes to the microphone and she tells all the teachers and staff, y'all must leave. And they had people there like security brothers and stuff helping them to leave. So they all leave out the door. And then she goes and she talks to them about the conditions that they were dissatisfied, that, that they know that their parents have been fighting the school board and have been, you know, you know, launching protests and stuff, but it's not, it's not working. So now it's time for the students to make the changes. So in, in a nutshell, this is what she does. She gets the students to basically boycott, and really it's a strike. They go down to the school board, they walk to the school board. The superintendent, a white superintendent tells them what they're doing is very inappropriate. They gave them demands. He didn't really take it serious. The next day or so, they make a phone call to the NAACP from Richmond. The NAACP sends a couple of lawyers and this is what Barbara John tells the lawyer. She says, look, we want you to file a suit against the school system here in Prince Edward County, Virginia. And that's what they do. And what's important here is this. If you understand the Brown case, the Brown case wasn't one case, it was five cases that the Supreme Court put together because they all had basically the same basic issues, legal issues. Of the five cases that make up Brown, and just for the record, one was a Delaware case, one was a DC case, one was a South Carolina case, one was a Kansas case, and one was a Virginia case. Of the five cases that made up Brown, only one case was initiated by students. And that was the Virginia case that Barbara Johns helped to lead. Now, ultimately they get death threats, they burn crosses in their yards, they go after her parents and all of that. Her parents make a decision to send her to Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama, they had a uncle who was one of her 
inspirations. His name was Vernon Johns. Some of you have probably heard the name Vernon Johns. Vernon Johns was the minister, he was a pastor of the Dexter Street Baptist Church. That name should ring a bell because the Dexter Street Baptist Church was the same church that Martin Luther King would become pastor of in, 19, in the early 1950s. And the person that he would replace was Barbara John's uncle. Okay, Vernon Jones. Now, Barbara goes to Alabama, of all places, if you ask me, um, and she keeps a low profile. Within two years, she's married, and then they end up moving to Philadelphia, where she's going to basically spin out uh, the remainder of her life. She goes to school, earns a couple of degrees, uh, becomes a librarian, but always regretting the fact that at the height of the movement that she helped to found, she was sent away. She always had a, you know, a, a, a trauma about not being able to finish. And then once she went to Alabama, it seemed that her uncle was not going to let her step out there because, you know, the, the presence of the Klan and some other reasons. So, so she was never able to kind of like finish that part of it. But yet, think about what this 16-year-old girl accomplished in the time that she had in Virginia. Extraordinary. Okay, from Barbara Johns, we need to talk about a woman by the name of Constant Motley. That's a name that some of you've heard of. Constant Motley, um, uh, her people were from the, uh, something just happened. Um, I don't see myself. Can y'all still see me? Yes, yes, yes. 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 we can oh, see I'll you. I'll just keep going. I just can't yeah. see myself now. But it's all, it's all good. Um, Constant Motley, her, her people were from the islands. Uh, I want to say Nevis. Um, but they ended up growing up in the uh, New York, in the uh, New York area. And when she was young, she, um, she worked for the NAACP, you know, as a, you know, as a student. And, you know, so she got to know some people. And then when she, when she was in law school, um, she, she clerked for Thurgood Marshall. Now, what you want to remember about Constant Motley is that with the Brown case, she wrote the, and check this out, she was a law clerk when she did this, okay? She wasn't a lawyer yet. She was a law clerk. But as a law clerk, she wrote the initial brief for the Brown case. And I want you to think about that for a second, okay? The, the initial brief is what started this thing off. It's what you have to put your, you know, your, you know, your legal arguments, you know, the basis of your arguments, the logic to your arguments, the evidence to your arguments. And this young law student is the person who did that. Now, later on, after she finishes school, she goes to Columbia Law School. After she finishes Columbia, she's hired by Thurgood Marshall to be, you know, a counsel, you know, a lawyer for the, you know, NAACP legal. I think that they had split by then. So it was just the legal defense fund. Because, you know, the NAA, the legal defense fund began as part of the NAACP, but then they separated uh, during the fifties, as I recall. So at any rate, um, now during her time as a member of the legal defense fund, she will argue nine cases, excuse me, 10 cases in front of the Supreme Court. She will win nine of them and then over time, the one that she lost is gonna be overturned. The Supreme Court, a later Supreme Court is gonna change their mind. 
And so ultimately, you could basically say she went 10 for 10. Um, she ultimately um, goes to New York. She runs for political office a couple of times and she wins. Uh, she became the borough president of Manhattan, uh, served there for a little bit. Uh, she was also a state senator in New York. Uh, I think she served maybe for about a term. Her focus was primarily equal housing. So she was basically an advocate and a warrior for equal housing. After that, she becomes a federal judge where she's going to basically retire from. So here you have a sister who, in many ways, you can make the argument that she begins the Brown case. Now, by now, you should see a pattern. A pattern should be developing. As we're looking at the civil rights for African people and during the 40s, during the 50s, there's a constant. And the constant is African women. And the tragedy is, is that, you know, the average student do not get much of this during the course of their education. Okay, let me keep going. I want to focus now on some of the local civil rights struggle leading up to the formal beginning of the civil rights movement, as they say. Now, I'm gonna start here in New York. There's a sister by the name of May Mallory. May Mallory is a mother in New York City. And what she does is she organizes other mothers. In fact, eight of them, nine including herself. They become known as the Harlem Nine. And in the 1950s, this is what they're gonna do for almost a stretch of the decade. They're going to protest. They're going to organize. They're going to picket. They're going to negotiate. They're going to threaten. And what all of this is about is the conditions of the educational system for their children, for African children. And in the end, these nine women are going to be predominantly responsible for desegregating the public schools in New York City, which is the largest school district school system in the United States. These nine women, mothers, just caring about their kids. Now, Mallory didn't stop. She didn't stop there at all. Um, unlike a lot of Africans during this time period, Mallory was one of the warriors in our history who believed in armed struggle. So after they desegregated the New York Public School, she ended up moving to places like North Carolina. North Carolina had a brother there by the name of Robert F. Williams. Robert F. Williams was the president of the NAACP chapter in Monroe, North Carolina. And he was a veteran of the Korean War. And when he got back you know, from the war, He decided that organizations like the Klan with their brutality and their violence and their hatred, that we had to answer them. So what he did was he organized rifle clubs in that region of North Carolina. Now it's gonna earn him the attention of the FBI who will ultimately frame him up on some stuff. And eventually he's gonna become a fugitive. But he publishes a book in 1961 called Negroes with Guns. 
And what it basically was, was it was a call to arms. Now, they wasn't talking revolution per se, as much as they were talking self-defense. When organizations like the Klan and white citizen councils and rednecks cops come after you, you must defend yourself. This is what May Mallory embraced until she died in around 2000, I think she died in 2006. So this is what I want you to understand. African women ran the gamut. We could go from being a mother laboring for our children to also being a warrior for our people and practicing self-defense if necessary. She's not gonna be the only one we're gonna mention in reference to that as well. Okay, so she was in Harlem. Remember, we're talking about local civil rights warriors. Also in New York, I need to introduce a woman by the name of Mamie Clark. Most of you have never heard of Mamie Clark. Most of you know her husband though. Her husband was Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark was a psychologist. And in fact, if you study the Brown case, you're gonna come across Kenneth Clark because this is what you're gonna come across him with. In the Brown case, one of the ways that the NAACP people argued their case was they used the, the doll test. And they had a black doll and they had a white doll. And they would ask, as part of the test, they would ask little African kids, which is the pretty doll? Which is the smart doll? Which is the intelligent doll? And in this test, the little African kids would always pick the white doll. And of course, their point was to say how segregated school systems, because of what they teach, and because of the conditions and everything, how it basically you know, de destroys the self-esteem of African kids. And this was one of the important strategies that will help to sway the justices in the Brown case. Well, here's the thing. Kenneth Clark was a brilliant psychologist, but he did not create that test. Now, there, there were some other similar types of tests earlier. So we can acknowledge that. His wife, Mamie, created that test. Technically, the two of them together, you know, got credit for the most part for it. It's just that his name is the name that you hear. And the thing about Mamie is she liked working in the background. You know, she was, uh, you know, she had a terminal degree in developmental psychology just like her husband did. But she was one of those sisters, you know, who put the emphasis on her family. And they said that she played that old school role of kind of like taking a back seat to her husband. So she didn't want the credit. But my thing is, is that it's not about whether I should want the credit, you earned the credit. And therefore, we should know who you are and we should be able to appreciate your contributions. And if we're gonna give it to your husband, then we show as hell should be able to give it to you as well. It's one thing if both of them were saying, you know, we don't want the credit, you know, it was just about the struggle, it was about helping our people, but he's taking bows. So we gotta get his sister her bows too. And by the way, she's also gonna be a pioneer in developmental psychology as it applied to African kids. That's pretty much where she's gonna spend the bulk of her professional career. She's also gonna create uh, a few institutes that focus on African children. Children were basically, you know, that's what you know, her passion was. Now she dies in, she dies in 1983. Um, she outlived, uh, her husband outlived her. Um, but we need to give her her props as well. So May Clark, we want to pay tribute to her. Now, that's New York. So we did two New York. What about Maryland? Well, when you talk about African women and civil rights in the state of Maryland leading up to 
the civil rights movement, one name stands out, I think, more than the rest. Her name is Juanita Jackson Mitchell. You might recall the Mitchell family, um, uh, a couple of politicians, uh, Clarence Mitchell, uh, Perrin Mitchell, both of them, uh, well, Perrin went to Congress. Uh, Clarence was, he was the NAACP's uh, chief lobbyist for like 40 years. They always called him the 101st senator because you know his, his influence when it came to promoting civil rights, the NAACP's you know, civil rights agenda. Now, who, enough of him. Who was his wife? Well, she's the first African woman to graduate from the University of Maryland Law School. Uh, you guessed it, she became a lawyer. And this is why we need to know the name Juanita Jackson Mitchell. More than any one person, she dismantled Jim Crow in the state of Maryland. What specifically? The public schools, the colleges, the beaches, the restaurants, the rec center, all of the public accommodations through one case or another case. This system invalidated those laws, those practices. You can go to places in Maryland today because of the labor of Juanita Jackson Mitchell. There should be statutes of this system in Maryland. Our kids should be studying her in schools. And so hopefully some of you will do some research on her and maybe get some stuff going. Because people who labor like that, they deserve to be honored after they've done their work. And I think she's been an ancestor, I think, since the 90s. And by the way, also in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, besides her legal work, she was also a major driver when it came to voting. You know, she, she led lots of voting drives for African people, which makes sense because voting was one of the things that she helped to break down some of the Maryland laws for her people. So that makes sense. Also locally, we wanna talk about Mary Church Terrell. Now, Church, Mary Church Terrell, she covered a lot of space. She's going to live to be 90 years old. She was born in 1863. And she's going to die two weeks, no, excuse me, two months after the Brown case. She's going to, she's going to die in July 1954. Okay? So this woman, she knew Booker G. Washington. She knew W.E.B. Du Bois. She knew Garvey. She knew all of the big wigs. She knew Ida B. Wells. Do you see, what I'm, you see where I'm going with this? She knew a who's who during her lifetime. She was also a major player in the Black Women's Club music um, movement, as they call it. Like the um, National uh, Council for, for what used to be Negro Women. She was one of the founders of that organization and several like organizations going all the way back to the turn, actually to the 1890s. Okay. And she participated in a multitude of conferences, 
meetings and other groupings of African people. She did it for a lifetime. Now, when she got up in age, oh, 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 I haven't mentioned this. She also was a teacher and for a period she was a principal of the M Street School in DC. The M Street School is generally considered to be the most prominent public school for African people in history. If you look at some of their graduates, it's a who's who. And if you look at some of the people who work there, you know, people like Anna, Anna Cooper, for example, um, it was a who's who for African people doing, you know, and we're talking about over like a 40, 50 year period. Today it's called Dunbar Senior High School in DC. Okay, so she was also a major player in the women's rights movement. So much so, if you ever get a chance, um, Seneca Falls is the site of the, um, the National Women's Rights Museum. And if you go there, they don't have as you know many African women like they should, but they have a nice display of Mary Church Terrell because of the role that she played in securing the right to vote for women. Uh, even though, remember, that was primarily white women because most African women lived in the South and there were other barriers that prevented us, that prevented our women from voting. But anyway, she was a major player and she knew all of the white big wigs. You know, she knew Susan B. Anthony. She knew Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, she knew uh, uh, Kat and Alice Paul and all of the major white women activists that labored to get the right to vote for women, particularly for white women. Now, when she was in, when she was in her late 80s, from 1950 to 1953, Mary Church Terrell was still active in desegregating Washington, DC. Remember, in the 1950s, Washington, D.C. was still a segregated city. People forget that. She was a leader. I'm not saying she would just, you know, you know, she would just go and drop me off and I'll sit with everybody else. This woman was calling the shots. She was developing strategy. She was the spokesperson when she's 88, 89, and 90 years old. And one other thing about um, Mary Church Terrell that's kind of interesting. If you see, if you research her life, she was real bourgeoisie. You know, she came from she came from means. Her father was a Memphis businessman. He would have been the equivalent of a, a millionaire during that time period. And then she married an African man who was a lawyer who became a judge in the D.C. area. So she always had means. She was known to wear long gloves and different hats. And, you know, she was really into that bourgeoisie type stuff. But as she became an old woman, she didn't give a damn about none of that stuff no more. You know, it was like the old Mary Church Terrell couldn't be seen in public unless she had a certain type of grooming, a certain type of decorum and all that stuff. This Mary Church Terrell, when she was struggling in the middle of struggling, as an elder for her people didn't care how groomed she was. It was about struggle. And that type of growth, I've always found that type of growth to be impressive, particularly if you know her history. Like Ida B. Wells was one of our greatest um, leaders. I, I talked about her in my February speech, Ida B. Wells. They were always at odds with each other and mostly it was Mary Church Terrell sabotaging and stuff. They organizing meetings and her and her group forget to tell Ida when it is and stuff and just different silly things like that. They didn't think Ida was groomed enough. You know, they didn't think that 
she woo enough the, the right perfume, all this silly type of stuff. But the older Mary Church Terrell wasn't into that silly stuff no more. So at any rate, Washington, D.C., one of the reasons why Washington, D.C. allows African people to go places that we couldn't go to before is because of people like Mary Church Terrell. And by the way, she died two months, I think I mentioned that, uh, after the Brown case at the age of 90. Okay, I wanna say uh, one more local person and I'm gonna be in Maryland again. I'm, I'm gonna go to Eastern Shore. We need to talk about a sister named Gloria Richardson. Gloria Richardson went to Howard. While, and uh, she was from Eastern Shore. She's from the Cambridge area. Uh, which is where she's going to settle once she finishes. Um, she goes to Howard. While she's at Howard, she participates in some of the students, you know, activism to try to, you know, desegregate um, white-only establishments. And then afterwards, she goes back home to Cambridge. And in Cambridge, in 1963, during the summer of 1963, Cambridge had an explosion, a race explosion. African people, which she was the leader of, we were protesting. Uh, we were tired of the brutality. We were tired of the discrimination. And it got so bad that uh, there was a period in which there was armed struggle. Africans had guns and whites had guns. The attorney general at the time was Robert F. Kennedy, and he ultimately comes to Cambridge, sends people to Cambridge, and they created what they called a treaty to kind of calm the things. At any rate, Gloria Richardson is the primary spokesperson and the primary leader for the African community during the Cambridge episode. If you listen to some of Malcolm's speeches, Malcolm was so impressed by Gloria Richardson that he invited her up to come to, you know, one of his lectures and stuff, some of the speeches, so that he could spend time and, and they could share information and stuff like that. At the March on Washington, she was one of the African women, I'm going to talk about that in a second, who was invited to be on stage because of her efforts at the Cambridge um, explosion of 1963. Okay, I wanna change, I wanna change the tone for a second here. Now I wanna talk about the greatest motivator of the civil rights movement. So now we're getting close to talking about the actual civil rights movement. We've been talking about, we've been leading up to it because nothing can, you just can't jump in to a movement. Movements are built for the bottom up. Who was the greatest motivator for the civil rights movement? Who was the greatest inspiration for the civil rights movement? Well, the short answer to that, in my opinion, was a woman by the name of Mamie Bradley. Maybe Bradley was a school teacher from Chicago. And she had a son, his name was Emmett. And during the summer months, they were from Mississippi. They would send Emmett to Money, Mississippi to spend time with his uncle man by the name of Mose Wright. During the summer of 1955, a couple weeks before she was supposed to go pick him up, Emmett is basically kidnapped 
by what turns out to be two white men and he had some other people with him, with them. Supposedly, Emmett had said something to one of the men's, they owned a store, to one of the men's wife. And then he was away at the time, the husband. When he gets back, a couple of days later, the wife tells him. And they knew the uncle, you know, one of Mo's, Mo's rights nephews or something like that. So these two white men knocks on most rights door, ask him about, do you got a nephew here? He's the one that had on blah, blah. I think he goes by the name of blah, blah, blah. Anyway, most rights for all practical purposes, hands over his nephew to men he knows do not mean him well, do not mean his nephew well. He hands them over. And what they're going to do is they're going to take that little boy and they're going to do horrific things to a 14-year-old child. And they brutally murder him. They will never answer to what they did to him. They will be acquitted by two juries in separate cases. Now, how does his death and how does his mother motivate? Well, this mother had to go to Mississippi to retrieve the horrific body because after they brutalized this boy for hours, then they threw him in, in the local river. And you know, if you've ever seen photographs of Emmett Till's body, it, what they did to that little baby, it doesn't even look like a human being. His body doesn't look like a human being. And this grieving mother made a decision. She said enough was enough. She made the decision that she was going to have an open casket. She wanted the whole world to see what those despicable lowlifes did to her baby. She wanted to wake up the United States and the world to the horrors of racism, to the horrors of racial violence, to the horrors of immorality. And in the process, this is what she's going to do. She's going to awaken a generation, actually multiple generations of activists, of people who didn't know they were activists. If you want to do some interesting research, get a list of the major civil rights activists and leaders of the 50s and 60s and go to their bios and look at, whether it's autobiography or interview or whatever, or speech, look at what motivated you to get involved in struggle. What motivated you to become an activist, to become a demonstrator, to become a protester, to join this organization or that organization? And the common denominator that you're gonna see more than once, just consistently, they're gonna tell you, looking at that boy's body, I had to do something. When they killed that baby and I saw his grieving mother, I had to do something. I didn't know what I had to do, but I knew I had to do something. You're gonna hear that consistently from some of our most prominent activists. And that's why Mamie Bradley is on this list. Because she decided to share her pain 
with our people in general, with this racist nation, and with the world. And like I said, she awakened people who ordinarily wouldn't have moved. She moved them. And for that reason, she is on my list. Now, let's talk now about frontline warriors, people who were in the thick of it. I'm gonna start with a sister named Septima Clark. Septima Clark was, uh, she was from the Sea Island area of South Carolina. And uh, she was a school teacher by trade. And ultimately what ended up happening was, uh, let me see, it was either, uh, I think it was Columbia. She worked in Columbia. And ultimately what ended up happening is she started, there was a school in the Spoky Mountains of Tennessee owned by African people. And it was a school for adult education. And this particular school, the name of the school was the Highland Folk School. And the owners decided that this particular school had an important role to play in our struggle. So this is what they did. They hired Septima Clark to be in charge of workshops and basically adult education training. Now, what was what were they training? What was she training people in? She was training people in a couple of things: citizenship, literacy, voter education, and eventually they're going to be training people on how to practice nonviolent tech. And as it turns out, Septima Clark was a master teacher. And she's going to also help people learn how, to, you know, like these are basically farming community, rural farming communities. So she's going to teach them how to do income tax, how to fill out voting registration cards, all these types of things. And so eventually what's going to happen here is that communities around the South and even North are gonna start sending people to the Highland Folk School for training. So she's gonna become a training ground, not just for regular folk, but also for activists. And just to put this in some context, in September, 1955, one of the people who came and trained for a few days under Septimus Clark, her name was Rosa Parks. And one of the things that she always talked about was she said, if only she could market the spirit of Septima Clark. She said it was like overpowering to be in her presence. Well, Septima Clark, her training is going to be so successful that in 1961, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is the organization of ministers that Martin Luther King founded, are going to basically purchase the school and make it part of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Even though, unfortunately though, she talks about her experiences. And one of the problems with organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was sexism. And that's from King, and Abernathy on down. I think the one of the people that they had good things to say about, I think was Andrew Young was not as bad as the rest of them. But sexism was a problem in the civil rights movement. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And by the way, Seven Clark also earned the title. King, King said that she was the mother of the civil rights movement. Others called her the grandmother of the civil rights movement, while others called her the queen mother of the civil rights movement. So Septima Clark is certainly someone 
who you want to study. You want to know who Septima Clark was. And she was a master teacher, but she trained people. She's going to train the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which we're going to talk about in a second. She's going to train this, the SCLC, Southern Constitution Foundation. She's going to train members of CORE, the Congress for Racial Equality. She's going to train the NAACP. She's going to basically train the major civil rights organizations and some of our most important leaders. So remember the name, Septima Clark. Now let's start talking about the beginning of the civil rights movement. We got to go to Montgomery, Alabama day. Now, most people, when they go to Montgomery, Alabama, when it's time to talk about the civil rights movement, they start with Martin Luther King. And that is a horrible mistake. Because when you talk about the origins and the founding of the civil, of the civil rights movement, King is not a player yet. But who are some of the players? Well, you want to start with an organization called the Women's Political Council. And the president of this organization at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott was a woman by the name of Joanne Gibson, Joanne Gibson Robinson. She was an English professor at Alabama A&M, which is nearby. And these were basically professional women, as they called themselves. They were all basically college educated. A lot of them worked at Alabama A&M. Others worked in, in other capacities. These will be the people responsible for the Montgomery bus boycott. I think I alluded to them in my lecture in February. So let me go more details. Montgomery was like most cities. They had segregated busing systems. Nothing new there. A year and a half before the Montgomery bus boycott, Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council wrote the mayor of Montgomery, a man by the name of Gale. They wrote Mayor Gale a letter. It was a threatening letter. And what they basically said was this, if you do not desegregate the bus lines, the city bus lines in Montgomery, we are going to launch a boycott against you. Now, this is a year and a half. This is May, 1954, a couple of weeks after Brown. Are you seeing this pattern? Okay, so Gail didn't respond, Gail didn't care. So then what happens is this, Joanne Robinson hooks up with E.D. Nixon. E.D. Nixon was a low, uh, he was the head of the NAACP in Montgomery. He was a, what was then considered a very prestigious position. He was a, he was a Pullman porter, okay? And then there was a lawyer by the name of Fred Gray. Fred Gray had a law office on the second floor of a garage that was frequented by African people. So you got Joanne Robinson and her crew you got Fred Gray, the lawyer, and you got E.D. Nixon. And what they began to do was to strategize. They developed a strategy for, for desegregating the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama. And the way that they were going to do it was they were gonna do what they call test case. They would get African women who were viewed as the most marginalized and the most non-threatening in the eyes of the whites. They would get African women to violate the law. And the way that the law was set up in Montgomery was interesting. Well, what would happen is the bus stops 
and the the patron would go on the bus, put their money in the slot or whatever it was, and then if you're African, then you walk off the bus, walk to the back where the, you know, to the a back door of the bus, and then go onto the train uh, onto the bus from there. And then there was a cutoff point. Now, this is how the system worked. If there were no white people on the bus, then Africans didn't necessarily have to follow the rules and sit in the back. But once one white person got on the bus, then all the Africans had to go to the back of the bus. And there was a cutoff point as to where, you know, how far whites could go and Africans could go. So that's how the system was set up in Montgomery. So what this team of activists did was they basically encouraged people, violate the law, we will bail you out of jail, you will be arrested, we will bail you out of jail, and then Fred Gray will do the legal stuff. And what they were looking to do was to use the courts to destroy the segregation laws because they knew that these laws violated the constitution. That's what the strategy was. And that's what they developed. Now, Rosa Parks doesn't do her thing until December, 1955. But before Rosa Parks, there was a series of sisters that we need to talk about who were doing this, getting arrested, and for different reasons, for different reasons, the case isn't going to go anywhere. So who are some of these people? Well, four of these people, we're, we're going to talk about it real quickly, but four of them will later become part of a Supreme Court decision. First person we talk about is a sister by the name, uh, she, was, uh, she was 18 years old. I think she had just graduated high school. Her name was Mary Louise Smith. She was arrested 40 days before Rosa. That was October, 1955. Went through the thing, case didn't go nowhere. Aurelia Browder was the next person that we want to talk about. She was arrested eight months before Rosa. That case also didn't go anywhere. Claudette Coven was arrested at about the same time, about a month. Let me see, she was arrested a month, a month before. Uh, Coven was 16, no, she was 15 years old. And she was arrested nine months before Rosa. But one of the reasons why hers didn't go nowhere, uh, and she was a straight A student, a model citizen, but they're gonna find out that she was pregnant. And that's what's ultimately going to make her not the candidate that they wanted. And then there was an elder, an elder sister by the name of Susie McDonald. Now, Susie McDonald could pass. She was light enough to pass, but this sister didn't pass. And this was a sister. And she wanted you to know she was a sister. And she lived in the heart of, of the African community. They owned a business. Her and her husband were doing real well. And I think her age probably played a role. And for what we know about Susan McDonald, she ain't take no shit from nobody. And that might have also been one of the reasons why they chose, you know, not to, not to go there. Um, now, there was a fifth person that I just need to mention. Her name was Jeanette Reese. Now, initially, all five of these women are gonna file suit with Fred Gray. And this is the case that's gonna make it all the way to the Supreme Court. But Jeanette Reese will later withdraw her petition. So when the case finally makes it to the Supreme Court, She's not going to go there. She's going to withdraw because they intimidated her. 
And then to make it kind of worse, they tried to use her. Well, they ain't tried. They used her in a scheme in which they had her to lie. They had her to lie about Fred Gray doing something that he didn't do because they wanted to try to get him disbarred. They figured if they could remove Fred Gray from the picture, all of this stuff goes away. And she did it. But in the end, it, it, it had no teeth. So she's not one of the success stories in this case. You know, she kind of she kind of buckled, you know, and, and I guess, you know, intimidation and threatening your family and all of those types of things, you know, will eventually take its toll. But these four sisters, Smith, Browder, McDonald, and Colvin, will become part of a case known as Browder versus Gale. And when it makes it to the Supreme Court, that's on November the 13th, 1956. This is what will officially end the Montgomery bus boycott. Even, well, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. The Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court basically does in this case is they're gonna affirm another case that, that ruled in the favor of the plaintiff, that is the petitioners, to get rid of the law. But when the Supreme Court finally chimes in, you know, that pretty much did it, okay? So do you see a pattern here? You got four African women in this case. You got Joanne Robinson, organizing this whole thing, even though we do give credit to E.D. Nixon, we do give credit to Fred Gray. But as you can see, this Montgomery thing is predominantly an African woman affair. And by the way, who did all of the groundwork for the Montgomery bus boycott? The African women. The night before the boycott began, we know, for example, that Joanne Robinson and some of the other sisters, they stayed up all night. They printed between 31 and 50,000 flyers, depending on the source. That basically that they then put through, you know, throughout the community saying, do not ride any buses until further notice. And they put it in every house, in every church, in every African-owned business. Any place that they could put it, they put it. They also, it was the African women who organized the car pools that took people to work so that they didn't have to ride the buses. In other words, my point is, is that African women were responsible for the Montgomery bus boycott with the, with the support they got from Edie Nixon and the legal support they got from Fred Gray. Now, when does Martin Luther King enter the picture? Martin Luther King enters the picture after the boycott had begun. It was decided that they needed to have some type of a vehicle, some type of an instrument to be able to talk to the press, to let people know where things are going. And King, who was this young Baptist minister at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, hadn't been there too long, still didn't know a lot of people. He was selected because of his education and because of his articulation. But he is no leader of this. Now, over time, he's gonna become a leader. But as you can see, this thing is already underway and it's the African women. And then this is one of the tragedies of all of this. Once King and them come on board and then He's gonna bring some of the other ministers and stuff with him. They're gonna push the African women to the side. And then it's gonna become a brother's thing. And we've seen that too much in our history. And then over time, people are gonna assume King, like some books will say King founded the Montgomery bus boycott and all this type of stuff. Here's the thing though, I give King his props. King always told you, I did not organize the Montgomery bus boycott. He, 
He never lied about that. He always told you that. Read his own books, read his, listen to his speeches. He would even correct people when he was in an interview and they say, well, you know, the way you organize, I didn't do it. Now, he didn't always say the sisters did it, but he was at least honest enough to not take credit for stuff he knew he had nothing to do with it until down the road. So you're looking at this pattern, African women. Now we're into the formal portion of the civil rights movement because it normally begins with um, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott and there, you know, it's still African women are still basically dominating the show. Okay, I'm looking at the time. I, I know we started a little late, so I'm hoping y'all will give me the time to kind of finish, finish this. Okay, now, the Montgomery bus boycott, by the way, was a success. Uh, and uh, as incredible as it sounds, um, virtually no African violated the boycott. Every now and then, it was a report that, hey, I saw an African person on the bus, you know, when it drove by. But normally that didn't happen. It was an incredible show of unity, of cooperation with African people. It, it, was, it was extraordinary. And there too, I give the credit to the sisters because they organized that thing. That thing was organized. And they had, they had, and, and, they in anticipated certain things. And when those things happened, they were they were Johnny on the spot. Hey, somebody needs a ride, we make sure. Somebody needs to be picked up, we make sure. Somebody is working late, we make sure. They have all that stuff set up. It rains, we have a system in place for that too. So I give the sisters their credit for that. Okay, so, so sisters got the Montgomery bus boycott underway. So, Let's talk now about some of the other important events of the civil rights movement now that it's underway. Well, 1957, let's go to Little Rock, Arkansas. You have the, what goes down in history as the Little Rock Nine. And these were basically uh, young kids who were going to desegregate the uh, Central High School, which was the main high school in Little Rock. A court order had basically um, made it mandatory that these African, you know, that these kids, that African kids be allowed to go to this school. Now, here's the thing. Who was responsible for the Little Rock Nine, for that whole episode? There's a woman by the name of Daisy Bates that we need to know. Daisy Bates. She was a major player in, in the African community in Little Rock. Had her and her husband, husband owned a newspaper. The, the major newspaper that people, you know, in Baltimore for a long time, it was the Afro-American. In, um, in Little Rock, it was their newspaper. And so this woman, she basically put the whole thing in place. She was the one that facilitated the court case, made sure that they had lawyers on board, recruited the people for the legal stuff. And then once they won the case, she was the one that held the meetings and stuff to organize people to send their ch children. And they screened the kids. There was a certain type of student that they needed. They couldn't get a hot head because all hell might break loose. It, it was like certain things. She would be the person who would recruit, identify, talk to the parents and get the kids, the nine kids that are gonna go. She's the one who's gonna organize when the thing finally happens. She's the one they meet at her house to set up the plan, the strategy, you know, who's gonna pick up who, when, and where. Eisenhower was gonna send the guards, and so who's gonna be with which guards, all that stuff. Daisy Bates is responsible for all of it. And this is gonna last for about a year or so until Ernest Green. Uh, graduates. He's going to be the first to graduate. Uh, he, when he comes, he's already like a junior. He's going to spend one year and then he graduates. But Daisy Bates is the person responsible for the entire episode. Now, did she have help? Of course she had help. But a lot of the people helping her were also African African women. 
Now, we're approaching the 1960s. And there's a couple names we haven't mentioned yet that we got to mention. Ella Baker to start. Ella Baker was probably the greatest organizer we produced in the 20th century. And she's going to be a part of three of the major civil rights organizations of the 1960s. Now, she's going to be a member of the, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for six years. She's going to be the founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, where she's going to stay for three years. And she's going to be a member of the uh, a, a, on the uh, NAACP. She's going to work for the NAACP for 15 years. So let's do the math. 18 plus 6, 24 years. She's going to be working with one important major civil rights organization or another. And her philosophy was different from the philosophy of the leaders of all these organizations. She believed that power came not from the leadership down, power came from the masses up. And so she's gonna bump heads. She's gonna bump heads with King. She's gonna bump heads with Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. Who she's not gonna bump heads with is the students of the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee. They are going to love her because her approach was she would facilitate. Because her thing was in the end, you will make the decision. My job is to give you some things to think about. And she trusted them. She trusted their leadership and they loved her. I've had the pleasure of knowing members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Some of you know, one of my mentors was Stokely Carmichael who became the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They loved Miss Ella as they called her. And when I say they loved her, when she had her funeral in 1986, um, so many former SNCC people came. I mean, they just filled it. And black, white, red, yellow, if you were a member of SNCC, you came because you wanted to honor Miss Ella. They loved her. And she was an incredible organizer. She knew how to talk to people. She knew how to you know, facilitate discussion. She knew how to foment compromise. And she knew how to trust people to make the decisions in their own best interest. So you got to start there. Now, quick thing though, the first time you ever hear Ella Baker though was in the 1930s during the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, she lived in New York City. And she and a sister by the name of Marvell Cook, they went after a, 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 a tragic episode in uh, African urban areas. In this case, it was called the Bronx Slave Market. I might have mentioned that in my last presentation. I don't know. But here's a short of it. People would meet at this Woolworths in the Bronx in the mornings, African women. And white women and sometimes white men would come to this place. The women would always have a paper bag that had their uniforms in it. And their uniforms were domestic uniforms. And the whole purpose of this was for you to hire yourself out to work for a white person for that day, or sometimes it might be more than that, and hope that you would get paid. The problem with the so-called Bronx slave market, and the reason that they call it a slave market is because some of these African women, they were not paid. And there was no system in place for cops. Nobody cared. Some of them were mentally and spiritually and physically abused and raped. Because the women would come pick you up, or the white men would come pick you up, take you to their homes, and you don't have no real support mechanism. And sometimes you would agree to a certain amount after you cleaned up their house, and then they wouldn't, they might give you half, they might give you a third, they might not give you nothing. So it was a very abusive system. Ella Baker 
And Marvell Cook, Cook went after it. They wrote a series of articles and stuff to destroy it. And ultimately they succeeded in destroying it. And so that's where you first hear Ella Baker as an activist. Now, as the founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the early 1960s, Ella Baker will mentor a generation of leadership. Some of them are still leaders today. For example, um, Eleanor Holmes Norton has been the DC representative in Congress in, in the House for hell, 30 years or something like that. You know, she was she was one of Miss Bell, uh, uh, Miss Ellen's people. Um, Claiborne, um, the South Carolina uh, House representative member. Um, I'm actually going, I'm kind of going blank. Uh, John uh, Lewis. Yeah, John Lewis, right? All of them, all of the SNCC people, now some of them have died, some of them have retired, but it's a, a who's who of leaders and activists who were part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And again, that's Ella Baker. So remember, remember that name. Um, now, I want to talk about another major event that's coming. It's the sit-in movement. And most people begin February 1st, 1960, the Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. That's where most people begin. That's a mistake. If you're serious about studying the sit-in movement, you don't start with the African men, the four African men who sat in, you know, who sat in at the Woolworth and then launched the movement. Instead, you start at Bennett College. Bennett College is down the street from North Carolina A&T, where the brothers came from. Bennett College was a sister school. It was a sister school to A&T. I think it still is the sister school to North Carolina A&T. And what happened there is from September to November, 1959, the African women there, the students, they would hold nightly meetings in different dorm rooms to talk about the struggle and what the role of the African student was in the struggle. And they were plotting and they were planning during these times. They invited the brothers from North Carolina a and to come in. And so they started coming too. And they would hold these meetings for a planning, you know, or they would plan it because they were gonna, when the year turned, they were going to start implementing some of the ideals. They just wasn't sure on what the ideals yet, what the strategy was yet, what the plans were yet, what the tactics were yet. The brothers would come. And then they had a hiatus because of the break, exams and all that. Then they started kicking back up again in January. But the brothers, without telling the sisters, decided to make a move. And then, of course, once it happened, once those brothers did it, and then you know other a and students came, of course, the Bennett students came too. So it was African men and it was African women doing the sit-ins. And then it... It started happening all over the country. Well, all over the South, they had the sit-in movement. But this is my point. We know about the brothers, but we ignore the role that the sisters played in laying the foundation for the sit-in movement. And all I'm saying is we gotta look at this holistically. And when you look at it holistically, you gotta talk about the sisters first. 
Otherwise, you're doing what happened with the Montgomery bus boycott. You talk about King before you talk about the WPC. You talk about King before you talk about Joanne Robinson and the other sisters. And there's no justice in that if we're serious about the truth. Now, I'm starting to wind this down, but I need to talk about Diane Nash. Diane Nash, she was from Chicago, went to Howard, transferred from Howard to Fisk, and therefore she ended up in Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville, the African students, including Marion Barry, the you know, late former mayor of Washington, DC, they called him the mayor for life. They organized one of the most successful and impressive sit-in movements of the era. And the major force in that sit-in was this sister, Diane Nash. She was who they turned to for leadership. She was who was given the orders. She was the person that basically made the most important decisions in that particular movement. She was also, with several other activists, a co-founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. At the age of 23, she made a commitment that she would work in the interest of her people until death. And she, even though she's, she's an elder now, she has maintained that. Diane Nash. Now, we're not finished with Diane Nash, though, because after they desegregated the Nashville, after they desegregated the Nashville um, Woolworths and some of the other stores, from there she went to Rock Hill, which is another, you know, town in uh, North Carolina. And they did, uh, you know, they were arrested and they served like 30 days in jail. Now, they could have got bailed out, but she made the decision. They call it, uh, they call it a jail in. And what it means is this, a lot of the SNCC activists did this, but she was the first. What they're basically saying is, look, we could be bailed out. The local churches will bail us out. Sometimes the NAACP will bail us out. Sometimes, you know, the Urban League or some of these civil rights organizations. But their philosophy was this, they said, but if we, if we bail, if we let them bail us out, then we get compromised. We need to send the message that we don't have a problem serving our time, that you can't own us, that you can't, you know, put something over us, you know, dangle something in front of us for us to say, okay, uh, I won't, I won't struggle as much the next time, you know, because, you know, if I don't, or, or, or if I do, then I might not be bailed out. So her thing was we eliminate bail so that there's nothing to compromise struggle. Now, this is a hell of a philosophy. The average person can't understand it, but she understood it. And it's gonna be embraced by the rest of the SNCC activists. And it's going to become a very important tool because it sends out the message you cannot buy these students. Whether they get out early or late, they're not for sale. You can't compromise them. So after she did that, there's another important event going on while all of this is happening. We're in 1961 now. And this event is the Freedom Riders. The Supreme Court had ruled in a decision that it was unlawful for buses to be segregated in interstate commerce, going from one state to the next state. So what happened was the Congress for, Age for Racial Equality, CORE, they organized basically the Freedom Riders. And what the Freedom Riders were, these were basically Africans and whites activists, and they were gonna ride a bus basically from DC all the way down to New Orleans. They're gonna go from the from the upper part of the South to the lower part of the South in order to test 
the new law, which basically said you cannot discriminate. Well, along the way, white folks, rednecks, Klansmen, you name it, along the way, they brutalized, they bombed one of the buses. They knocked somebody unconscious. In fact, as, as I remember, John Lewis was not unconscious. He, he was one of the riders, the late John Lewis, who just died during the summer. Um, and so what happened was, by the time they got to Birmingham, they were ready to quit. Those people had been brutalized enough some of them had already quit. And then what ends up happening is Diane Nash meets them in Birmingham. And remember, this is Birmingham, Alabama. His nickname was Bombingham because they bombed so many African churches, so many African homes. This sister, and she had a few people with her, they meet them, they meet the bus in Birmingham. And when people are ready to quit, she revitalizes this movement. She inspired people to continue to fight. Her thing was, we cannot let this violence stop us. We can't, they win. And so they finished it out. They made it to New Orleans. And anybody who's ever studied the Freedom Riders will tell you, she might not have been there in the beginning to take the blows, but at the time that mattered the most, Diane Nash saved the freedom rights. And then we need to mention her, she continues to struggle throughout the 60s, but the next big time that we need to talk about very quickly is Selma. You know, they did a movie on Selma about four years ago and stuff. Um, some of it was facts, some of it was less than facts. But Diane Nash's role doesn't really come across as strong as it did in real life, but she was a major player in the Selma March. Now, why is Selma so important? Selma was, Selma was looking like a defeat and people like Diane Nash are gonna turn it into a victory. Even though there's gonna be some blows to play. Stokely Carmichael, my mentor, he was, he was there as well, and he wasn't even depicted in the film. So that tells you something right there about the accuracy of the film. But the thing that's significant is that the Selma March is, was kind of like the final, the final, what's the word I want? The final, um, what'd you say? Okay, my wife said chapter, so I can buy that. The final chapter, if you will, in what became the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So you had to finish up Selma, Diane Nash. We're gonna mention another sister too, Amelia Robinson. They are gonna be the major players. Now, King and them are gonna to get to play. The press is always gonna follow them, but the people, who have been on the ground even before King and them came through and stuff, were the Diane Nash, were the Amelia Boyton's Robinsons. Okay, um, okay, I really am winding this down. I have to talk about the, the March on Washington though. Not because it was necessarily an important event as far as struggle is concerned, because you know that's what King gave his famous I have a dream speech and all of that. But the March on Washington showed the demons in the civil rights movement. And what I mean by that is the ugliness of, of sexism. Now, think about this. Think about what you already know from what we've talked about. And that's just a little bit of the role that African women played in the civil rights movement. So now they're organizing this big march. And initially, if you can believe this, initially they did not want African women to participate in the march as far as being able to speak, as far as playing an active role. I'm talking about Martin Luther King, A. Philip Randolph, James Farmer, Whitney Young, the leaders of the march, A. Philip Randolph. 
initially they didn't want African women. So then they were pressed. Dorothy Height was part of the planning team. So she and some of the other sisters were pressing, well, that wouldn't look real good. Here we have a march for justice and jobs, and we're going to leave out half of the race. How much sense does that make? So then they rethought when they said, well, this is what we can do then. Why don't we set up some chairs on stage uh, and we identify maybe six or seven sisters and they can sit on the stage, we can introduce them and they can wave to the crowd. Ultimately, that's what they're going to do. Now, there was two sisters, though, that they, that they said, we will let them speak. Josephine Baker had let them know in advance that she was going to be coming in from Paris, from France, where she lived. And so they, you know, and she was an internationally known figure. So they said, hey, we got to let Josephine Baker speak. I mean, she's flying in from Paris. Even though James Baldwin flew in for Paris and they ain't let him speak because they couldn't trust Baldwin. And they scripted most of what was said, believe it or not, y'all, most of what was said at the March on Washington was scripted. Even John Lewis, who was not a radical by anybody's definition, even his speech was censored, even though he still got off a couple blows because he wanted to grab the Kennedy administration for their inactivity. And the leaders of the march said, no, we can't afford to, you know, to piss them off. And then the other person that they said, we're going to let her speak because her husband had just been gunned down two months before. And that was Merle Evers. Her husband, Megara Evers, was killed on the night of June 11th, 1963, two months before. He was a field secretary of the NAACP. So they said, you know, just out of, you know, we got to let her speak. As it turned out, though, she couldn't make it because she got caught up in traffic and a whole bunch of other things. So she wasn't able to speak. So who were the six women that they put on stage? Well, some of them we've already talked about. Daisy Bates. Gloria Richardson. Uh, let me see who else. Uh, Gloria Richardson. Um, Merle Evers, had she got there, Rosa Parks, Diane Dash, who we just talked about, and then the last one, her name was Paris Lee. She was the mother of a brother who was killed by the, you know, killed by some white priests. So those were the six people that they let get on stage. Now, here's the thing. Gloria Richardson, when they called her name, instead of her following the script, she got up and walked to the watch call and she, and she spoke to the crowd and she wanted to talk and they basically took the microphone from her. That's how scripted the March on Washington was. And the head of the largest African women's organization, Dorothy Height, one of the people who are part of the planning thing in all of this, they did not even allow her to speak at the March on Washington. Unbelievable. Okay, a um, few other names, and then I'm a, I'm a, I'm a stop. But okay, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, three women together that you want to talk about. Fannie Lou Hamer, Victoria Jackson Gray, and Annie Devine. These were three women who founded a democratic uh, organization. It, they normally, for short, they call it the Democratic Freedom, Freedom Now Party. And basically what they did was they challenged the Democratic Party in the South was a segregationist white supremacist organization, and they would not allow us to vote. They wouldn't allow us to participate in the voting in primaries and all of that. So what these sisters did was they broke off from the Democratic Party and create, you know, from the white Democratic Party and created a more just or in the Democratic Party. But in the end, they still did not, they tried to participate in the primary in 1964 because that was an election year and they wouldn't let them do it. Johnson, who was the president, 
ultimately he sided with the white races and stuff. But Fannie Lou Hamer testified before the nation. She gained national attention. And until she died in, in uh, 1977, she's gonna be a major force. When it, uh, she's also gonna hook up with SNCC. She's gonna participate in Freedom Summer that SNCC organized in 1964. And uh, she's going to form, uh, also in the 70s, she's going to form an African Farm Collective. So remember the name Fannie Lou Hamer. Amelia Robinson, I mentioned her earlier. Um, she was a major player in the uh, Selma March. Um, in fact, she was not unconscious during the Selma March. You know, that's the price that some of our African women played, uh, even if we don't even know their names. And then, of course, we need to mention, let me just make sure, I think I'm down to, oh, good, okay. I think I covered everything. Uh, just a few more things, y'all, so just hold on for another. Uh, Coretta Scott King, we got to mention her. Coretta Scott King, you know, um, was the wife of Martin Luther King. Um, she raised the children, you know, she made, you know, the sacrifices, if you will, uh, you know, for allowing King to know that his family is taken care of while he's out doing his business and stuff. But she was also an advisor to Martin Luther King. Um, by the way, she raised money for the movement by giving concerts. Cause you know, she was a skill, I think she was a violinist and she was skilled. So she would hold concerts to raise money for the civil rights movement. And she served as an advisor to Martin Luther King. In fact, it was Coretta Scott King who recommended that King come out against the Vietnam War when he did. Others, all the civil rights leaders were opposed to it. His top advisors, everybody was opposed to it. And in the end, as, as my wife always says, you know, a, a husband is supposed to listen to, to the wife and he'll stay out of trouble. I, what was that you say? Yes, yes, something like that. So King listened to his wife. That's right. And yeah. <laughs> I knew somebody was gonna say something, but he listened to his wife and um, he spoke out against the war. That was, that was April the 4th, 1967, one year to the day of his assassination. Um, and all the other civil rights leaders attacked him publicly. All of the major civil rights leaders attacked him. White money started drying up uh, because him, you know, because he chose to go against the military industrial complex by going against the war and stuff like that. But that's, that was Coretta Scott King more than anybody else who had recommended that. And that was part of the role. Now, when he was, uh, that she played, when he was killed, he was working on the Poor People's Campaign. She completed the Poor People's Campaign. And then after that, she was thrust into the spotlight. And Coretta Scott King, uh, she was much more liberal than Martin Luther King ever was. Uh, she supported, you know, everything from gay rights to environmental rights. And, you know, I mean, she, you know, you could always count on Coretta Scott King falling on the right side of history. You know, I never supported King's ideals for the most part, the, you know, all of that. I always respected Coretta Scott King. You know, she was, she had a certain amount of dignity that you just, you know, that commanded uh, respect. And she struggled to our people until she died in 2006. She was always, you know, on the right side of struggle. Okay, give me just five minutes. I'm just gonna run through some things real fast. Feminism. That was another form of civil rights that sisters are going to play a major role in. We can start with the SNCC women are going to write position papers during the 1960s about the importance of, of, of uh, women's rights and sisters being able to express themselves. We had people like, uh, I mentioned that Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm, who was a congresswoman from, uh, from the Brooklyn area. And I mentioned Pauli Mary, both of them were founders of the, you know, of, of now the National Organization for Women, uh, which was the, you know, white women's primary vehicle for struggle. We got to mention Frances Beale. Frances Beale wrote an essay in 1968 that laid the foundation, if you will, for Black feminism. So we have to appreciate her. 
We got the, the black feminist movement uh, during the early 1970s. We need to mention that. We need to mention the Kamahee River Connect, uh, the uh, Kamahee River Collective. This was an organization primarily of African women who were socialists. Most of them were also lesbians. They were by far one of the most radical groups you know, of the 1970s. They wrote a statement which basically outlined the most important components of black feminism. Uh, and certainly uh, you should read you should read that. Some of the names, uh, Barbara Smith, uh, Beverly Smith, uh, Audre Lloyd, you know, who was a brilliant uh, uh, analyst and stuff, uh, and also Gloria Hall. All of them were major players as far as Black feminism is concerned. I also had to mention the Black nationalists and the, the more radical wing of African struggle as that impacted the civil rights movement as well. I start with Queen Mother Audrey Moore. Uh, she was uh, a founder, a major player in the reparations movement. She was also a founder of the Republic of New Africa, which was founded in uh, 1968. Um, I always tell people that if you can say that Rosa Parks is the mother of the civil rights movement, then Queen Mother Moore was the mother of the Black nationalists, the Pan-Africanists, the more radical part of the African struggle. Angela Davis, who was on the FBI's most wanted fugitive list in the 1970s, because uh, she purchased some guns that were ultimately used in a what really amounted to a prison break, but it happened at a courthouse. So I guess it was a courthouse break. And you know, since that time, you know, she's also been in the forefront of Black feminism and also uh, prisoners' rights, and also you know, Black Black struggle. So we certainly want to give, uh, you know, uh, our respect to Angela Davis. And then you had certain. Uh, there were several Black Panther women that we want to mention. Are uh, Erica Huggins? Uh, she was the head of the. Uh, well, she was a co-head of the Black Panther Party in New Haven, um, Connecticut. And then for about seven years, she directed the Oakland, the uh, Black Panthers had an Oakland community um, school uh, in, uh, in, uh, in California that she directed that for like eight years. We gotta mention Elaine Brown. Elaine Brown was the head of the Black Panther Party. She was the chair, chairperson from 1974 to 1977. Uh, we certainly want to acknowledge her. Kathleen Cleaver, we want to at least mention her name. She was the communications secretary for the um, uh, Black Panther Party. She was also one of the co-heads of the New Haven uh, branch. They actually had three, three co-heads. Um, they had Huggins, they had uh, Kathleen Cleaver, uh, and um, the other one will come to me in a second. We have to mention Asada Shakur. Asada Shakur was more, she spent most of her time not in the Black Panther Party, but in the Black Liberation Army. The Black Liberation Army was the military wing. Well, it was the most radical part of the Black Panther Party, broke off and created the Black Liberation Army in the early 1970s. Asada Shakur joined them. Ultimately, she got into a skirmish on New Jersey Turnpike uh, where a panther was killed and a cop was killed. And she's going to be charged uh, with murder. She's going to be found guilty. They gave her life. And members of the Black Liberation Army, in addition to um, uh, white members of the Weather Underground, are going to break her out of the Clinton of, of the Clinton Women's um, Correction Facility. That was in 1979. She goes underground in the United States for the next five years, and then ultimately she ends up in 1984. She ends up in Cuba, and Fidel Castro granted her asylum in 1984. Uh, in 2003, during the Obama administration. The FBI named Asada Shakur. They put her on their most wanted terrorist list. How they make a, a Asada Shakur a terrorist is beyond me. We also need to mention Afini Shakur, who was the mother of Tupac Shakur 
and uh, her birth name was Alice Faye Williams. Uh, she was one of the Panther 13, and she defended herself in that trial. That was a trial in which the FBI went after the leadership of the Black Panther Party in Connecticut, in New York, and New Jersey. Uh, she ended up, she served two years during the trial and everything. She defended herself. And in the end, the Panther 13, all 13 were acquitted within about an hour and a half. Uh, that's how long it took a jury to basically dismiss all charges. Why? Because they were all fabricated under the counterintelligence program of the FBI, which I did talk about the last time. Two other people that we want to mention, and then we're going to call it today. Sophia Bakari, her birth name was Bernice Jones. Uh, she joined the Black Panther Party, and then she joined the military wing, the Black Liberation Army. Um, the FBI ended up arresting her, charging her with all types of charges. She was given 40 years. Um, most of the, I mean, all of the charges were pretty much fake. And so ultimately she was, she served, uh, let me see, she was, uh, she served about six years and then she was paroled because the stuff was basically make-believe. She continued to struggle for her people. Um, she even organized the Mamil Abu Jamal's, um, uh, the free, free Mumil movement. She organized that. Uh, she later got, uh, she later got married and she ended up dying at the age of 53, but she spent almost her entire adult life struggling for African people and was willing to go to jail, willing to fight, willing to die and to die basically and to kill for African people. So we give our uh, pay homage to Sophia Bakari. And then finally, two movements that are still going on today that we just wanna mention, the Me Too movement, which was basically the, the, the brainchild of a sister named uh, Tarana Burke, um, from that face, what's it called? Space book or something? Space book page or something? Anyway, she founded this movement Facebook. that empowered women, right? And then the last one, of course, we got to mention the Black Lives Matter, which were founded by uh, by three African women. Um, um, and they have been in the forefront of the, um, you know, justice for, for African people. So uh, I'm going to uh, thank you for him for indulging me. Uh, I got through it. So now um, I've said what I wanted to say. I, I'm looking at the time. It's, you know, a little bit over, but I will entertain any questions that you have. Um, do they need to unmute or something like that? Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I don't have any questions, but thank you for all your information. It was really good. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any questions though? I love, I love questions, Steve. This is the part that I like, is the part that I get to hear from you. And then, you know, we, we can have conversations. So if you got a question, please ask the question. I've got something to add. Uh -huh, go ahead. Um, um, it was Dr. Helena Hicks at Morgan. Uh, she was a part of the Morgan sit-in movement that they had in 1955. And they're trying to push that to be one of the sit-in movements that CORE helped to plan with Morgan. And uh, okay. Morgan has that exhibit of the lunch counter uh, in the university center now. And okay. I can't think of the, of the, the lawyer that wrote about it. I can't think of his name right now, but he spoke at our Constitution Day at one time. Um, okay. But Morgan's now looked at as uh, 1955 as having the, the first uh, lunch counter set in for Baltimore. Okay. Right. Uh, hey, Mom, we uh, used to have a brother who taught sociology. He passed. I can't remember his name to kill me. What was his name? Because he was part of the Morgan move, student yes, movement, yes. too. I, I know you're talking about uh, Walter. And it, it bothers Dean. me that I can't Walter remember him Dean. because I really Walter, liked him. Walter Dean. Walter Dean, right. That's yeah, right. he was also, from what I understand, he was a major he force was. with the he student was. movement in Morgan. He was, he was. But and was that the 60s or the 50s? 55. 55, okay. 55. Yeah, Walter Dean, y'all remember remember mm -hmm. that name, Walter Dean. And um, um, I, oh, sorry. 
just one last thing, and Morehouse uh -huh. is are the brothers to Bennett. Although Say it again, Mom. Morehouse Say it again. is the brotherhood to the sisterhood of Bennett. But you know that A and T is right across the street. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I spoke at uh, A and T mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. years ago, and you could just you know just it's walk right there. I know my more, my daughter went to Bennett. They right there. Right. Just walk. How did that happen though? Street. How did that happen? Why wouldn't Bennett? Why wouldn't? I, I don't be? even know. I don't even know. Okay, Mama, I'm mm -hmm. confused though. So what about? Okay, so they not the who, sister, who is Spellman? Who is Spellman? The sister two did. No, I don't know. My daughter might know, but she knew that they had every okay. time Morehouse had their homecoming. The Bennett girls were invited as part of their sisterhood. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure there's some logic in there, by the way, because Morgan, uh, because Morehouse and Spellman are kind of like right across the street from each other, right too. Across the street too. <laughs> yeah, so I always thought they were just brothers and sisters, but that tells you what I know. So, okay, thank you, Mom. Oh, we appreciate it. Well, I, I have a question, um, and actually a little bit of uh, history. Um, speaking upon, upon Morgan, my, um, my late uncle, Ermin Jones, was actually a, a, an Omega Psi Phi man and went to Mor Morgan State University and was actually a big part of the civil rights movement up in uh, Neptune, New Jersey. He actually was, since we talked about the um, March on Washington, he was actually right next to Martin Luther King, next to the podium uh, during the uh, March on Washington. So um, I forgot my question. It was- Was um, he one of the brothers that had on one of those white uniforms? Uh, probably, yeah, because he was, he, he was part, he was a Q. So he was, they actually went to um, Little Baltimore History right before the March on Washington. Martin Luther King actually went to the uh, the Masonic Temple on Utah Place downtown um, to go. But I had a question. So so how would you, so, so I noticed that you hadn't brought up uh, um, Greek letter organizations at all. So what, 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 what um, um, instrumentation did, um, you know, Greek letter organizations, either sorority or fraternity, what did they play into the civil rights movement? Well, what I can tell you, though, is that when it came to the sit-ins, when it came to, you know, you know, the um, even the um, the ride, the uh, the freedom ride, you got a mixture of and remember my focus. Let's be clear on something. My focus today was African women. So let's be clear on that. I wasn't here here to talk about the brothers doing this or that or brother fraternity and all that. But there were sisters, places like Bennett, Nashville, Fish, different places like that. Some of them were members of organizations. Now, does that mean that they did the things as organizations? What I, could, what I would suggest to you is this, oftentimes they would do it as individuals versus doing it as organizations. And the reason being, is that if you know the history of the leadership of Africans, HBCUs during the civil rights movements, students would get kicked out for being activists. Organizations would get kicked off campus if they struggled as an organization. So what I would suggest to you is that I'm sure there were lots of sisters and lots of brothers who were members of these you know, Greek letter fraternities, but not necessarily, you know, doing it, you know, as an organization for fear that the administration might come after them. So we need to be clear on that. And in I, fact, I, I'm reminded, uh -huh, I'll go ahead. I just want to add that Dorothy Height was AKA. Um, Enolia, Enolia McMillan, she was the first black, I mean, not what the first, but she was head of the national NAACP from Maryland, uh, and and uh, so she also was an AKA, and Juanita Mitchell was an AKA, and uh, who else? It was, it was about quite a few. And Gloria Richardson, she bucked the, the AKAs because of their opinion on dark skin black women, and she mentioned that in right. an article uh, based mm -hmm. on her fight in civil rights. So uh, a, a great majority of them were, that you mentioned today, were uh, AKAs. Okay, thank you, Mom. Any other questions? 
I have a question. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm probably the youngest out of the group here. But um, I realized when I was in high school that in my history class, you know, of course, around Black History Month, they would talk about, you know, the civil rights movement, and, you know, some of the main pe people like Malcolm X, you know, Rosa Parks and things of that. And I think I my biggest issue was, or maybe I'm not really sure. So I guess that, you know, since you're a professor, you have a little bit more information about it. Why is it that they don't talk about, you know, more so kind of farther back into history as far as how we were queens and, you know, kind of like when we were in our royal stages. So is that like a conspiracy or two, you know, maybe a little far in religion, perhaps? Like, why doesn't anyone talk about that? And it's more so around like civil rights and, you know, kind of during the struggle right. period. We live in a society that was founded on white supremacy and on the myth of white superiority and the myth of black inferiority. The educational system promotes these principles. Any information that is designed to challenge the black inferiority myth, the general public school systems historically have avoided it. Now, I don't mean that you can't get teachers who are serious and who infiltrate the public schools to teach you things like that. But for the most part, you're not gonna find them in the curriculum and they don't want you as a teacher to go outside the curriculum. So the bottom line to kind of answer your question is that the educational system of the United States is not designed to empower us. The educational system is designed to condition us to think a certain way. And the way that they want us to think is a way that basically validates American institutions, American ideals, American concepts. African this and African that, or even when it comes to original people, so-called Native Americans, groups of color run counter to, you know, positive information about groups of color runs counter to what the United States educational system is about. Do you so that's think a short that, answer to your question. Do you think that, is that the reason because, you know, around this time of Women's Month and everything that I don't really see it, you know, me being young and on social media and things like that and hearing it on the radio. Um, and even when they make movies about it, they don't really even talk about it either. So not only in schools, but do you think that the schools is why they are not talking about it? Like, you know, for other people who have more information about their background, it just seems as though they are scared to talk about it. Other than, you know, mm -hmm. like just using other platforms. Right. No, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, what you're saying is, is valid. I think it's, it's all of the above, you know, the educational system is just the linchpin for the political system, the economic system, the social system, the cultural system. All of these things are intertwined. And white supremacy and the white superiority myth and the black inferiority myth, they have basically infested. Basically, the core of the American system has been infested by white supremacy, white superiority myth, and the black inferior, I mean, the white superiority myth and the black inferiority myth. Mm -hmm. And of course, you need to add some other things to that too. Sexism, classism, mm -hmm. uh, religious bigotry, all of these things play a role in the system. Okay, uh, thank you. Any other questions? How can we start a movement to assist and help our kids? It hurts my soul and my heart to have this young man and his mother on TV stating that he's in high school, his mother thinking he's going to graduate, and they want to put him back to the ninth grade to start all over because he only passed three classes in four years. And that's a disgrace. It's just time to stop. And I'm ready. Professor Hatchett, you just ignited a fire. 
and we we need to do something. And I'm, like you said, I don't know what to do, but I'm ready to do something. I'm here, I'm ready. And, you know, because we have to build up our generations, our kids. And then we have to put um, emphasis on, you know, helping, and helping the struggling individuals to have these kids. I understand it's a trickle effect. Um, but we, I, I believe, and I could only talk about me. I'm ready. Um, okay. Or what? Or what I would suggest, you know, you know, is that you sit down, and um, you know, chart out, chart out a plan. Like, what's the, what's your objective? You want to look at the school system as a whole, or is that particular case, you know, it what you want to you know, go I know, after? And stuff? I know too many people that has been pushed through the system uh -huh. and those are the ones that's standing out on the corner not only are they pushing them through the system they're giving our babies all this medication you know yeah. and then they left to what type of device their parents on drugs or they struggling they don't have the education to feed the kids or you know and 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 then we have some that's out there working that has to work two and three jobs and I'm leaving my kid to the school to help me. And we not, he's not getting the help that he needs. You know, so you. One, I'm gonna strategize the plan. Um, are you on um, any social medias or how can I contact you? I'm assuming through my professor. Um, and professor, yeah. get ready after your vacation. We're gonna strategize a plan. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, you can contact me through through uh, Professor Hackett. Okay. Because okay. it's it's just a crime shame, and it hurt my heart. And a lot of things that she's been teaching us um throughout this, you know, two semesters I've been with her, it's like stop teaching me because I mean it's like, and I'm not a violent person, but I'm ready to get my gun. I'm ready to get my gun because I know the white supremacists, they coming. You know, it's right. too many of what? us. Huh? Right. Um, one question for you. Are you affiliated with a church? Yes. Dr. Dane, okay. the professor over at uh -huh. Churches, right. Churches are some of our strongest institutions. And one of the things that we always want to, you know, to fall back on and okay. to use as an instrument are okay. institutions like, like our churches. Okay. You know, so start thinking about how how that might be able to fit into, you know, what you're thinking about as well. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor, good evening. This is Yolanda Coates. Um, the last two things that you mentioned was um, the, the two movements, the Me yeah, Too the movement Me and Black, uh -huh. Black Lives Matter. Uh -huh. um, my question is, during your um, presentation or lecture, you talked about all the movements that matter and something was done after the fact, something changed. So my question is, um, what are your thoughts about these two movements that you mentioned last in your lecture? Do you think that those movements are gonna change something with our constitution, with our um, culture, with our people? I think they, yeah. I think they have, particularly Black Lives Matter. I think they have for a minute changed. They've, they've changed the way people think. And remember, we underestimate how powerful that is. You know. Think about this, just the concept itself. Now, white people, a lot of white people come down hard because their thing is by saying that black lives matter, the implication is that white lives and other groups don't, don't matter. They're missing the whole damn point. That's not what that's about. What black lives matter is reminding us is that we are valuable. We are decent. We are people who deserve to be treated like human beings. Just that concept by itself, you know, even, you know, you know, just to put it out there is revolutionary. Now, one of my challenges right now with uh, Black Lives Matter is, first off, I would like for there to be more definition given 
as far as what the game plans are, where are we, you know, what are we trying to do, particularly now, because they've come into quite a bit of money. So I would really like to see how they're going to be using that money in order to, you know, to affect change and stuff like that. But I've always appreciated Black Lives Matter. I think the fact that the women who founded it, you know, you know, they wear different hats. You know, I think at least two of them are lesbians. One of them is, you know, is from an immigrant family. I think those are valuable assets for our people because it means that they've had experiences. They've walked into areas that have been marginalized, you know, areas in which people have been marginalized. You know, they know pains that the average brother or sister necessarily wouldn't know because they haven't walked in their footsteps. So my thing is, is that that should give them, you know, a much broader uh, insight to deal with some of the issues that we need to deal with. But there is an accountability issue right now, particularly with Black Lives Matter, that I think that they do need to address. Because my understanding is, you know, they've, they've gotten somewhere close to $100 million in donations since the, since the George Floyd thing. And that has to be, you know, that has to be accounted for. And how is that going to fit into the larger struggle? You know, that's what that's what I want to see with Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Okay. Any other any other questions? Because if not, we can we can start wrapping it up. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. And everybody, have a have a good break. Uh, and